I'm just going to read it straight. No matter how many mistakes I make, <clears throat> I'm going to read it straight. Yes. This is Watership Down, Chapter 13, Episode 13. <clears throat> Hopefully just Part 1 and remain that way. Called Hospitality. In the corner of the opposite wood, it turned out to be an acute point, and beyond it, the ditch and the trees carved back again to a re-enterant. What happened? Oh. So the field formed a bay with a bank running all the way around. It was evident now why Cowslip, when he left, had gone among the trees. He had simply run in a direct line from their holes to his own, passing on his way through a narrow strip of woodland and that lay between. Indeed, as Hazel turned and pointed, uh, turned the point and stopped to look about him, he could see the place where Cowslip must have come out of. A clear rabbit track led from the bracken under the fence into the field, and in the bank on the further side of the bay, the rabbit holes were plain to see, showing dark, distant, and a bare ground. It was, it was as conspicuous a warren as it could well be imagined. Sky above us, said Bigwood. Every living creature for miles must know it, sir. <laughs> Look at all those tracks in the grass, too. <laughs> Do you think they sing in the morning like little thrushes? Perhaps they're too secure to bother about considering themselves, says Blackberry. After all, the home warren was fairly plain to be seen. Yes, but not like that. A couple of Rudadoo can go down those holes. <laughs> so could I, said Dandelion. I'm getting dreadfully wet. As they approached, a big rabbit appeared over the edge of the ditch and looked at them quickly and then vanished into the bank. A few moments later, two others came out and waited for them. They, too, were slick and unusually large. A rabbit named Cowslip offered shelter us here, says Hazel. Perhaps you know he came to see us? Both rabbits together made a courteous dancing movement of the head and front paws. Apart from sniffing, as Hazel and Cowslip have done when they met, formal gestures except between mating rabbits were unknown to Hazel and his companions. They felt mystified and slightly ill at ease. The dancers paused and evidently, evidently waited for some acknowledgement of reciprocal gesture, but there was none. Cowslip's in the great barrow, said one of them at length. Would you like to follow us there? Um, how many of us, said, asked Hazel. Why, all of you, answered the other, surprised. You don't want to stay out in the rain, do you? Hazel, I suppose, he and two, one or two of his companions would have con been taken to see the chief rabbit, who probably not being be Cowslip, since Cowslip came out to see them unattended in his burrow. After all, it would be given different places to go to. It was this se separation of which he was been afraid. He now realized with astonishment that there's a broad, apparently a part of the warren underground which was big enough to contain them all together. He felt so curious to visit it that he did not stop to make any detailed arrangements about the other in which they would go down, the order of which they would go down. 
However, he put Pipkin directly immediately behind him. It's warm, it'll warm his little heart for once, he thought. And if the leaders do get attacked, I suppose we can spare him easier than some. Bigwig, he asked, to come up the rear. If you see any trouble, get out of it, he says, and take as many of them as you can with you. He followed the guides into one of the holes in the bank. The run was broad, smooth, and dry. It was obviously a highway for other runs to branch out in all directions. The rabbits in front went fast, and Hazel had little time to sniff about as he followed. Suddenly he checked. He came into an open space. His whiskers could feel no earth in front of him and none near his sides. There was a great deal of air ahead of him, and he could feel it moving. And there was some considerable space above his head. Also, there were several rabbits near him, and it had not occurred to him that there would be a place underground which he would be exposed on all three sides. He backed up quickly, quickly and felt Pipkin at his tail. What a fool I have been, he thought. Why didn't I put silver there? At this moment, he heard Cal slip speaking. He jumped, and for what he could tell, he was some way away. The size of the place must be immense. Is that you, Hazel? said Cowslip, you're welcome, and so are your friends. We are glad you come. No human beings except the courageous and the experienced blind would be able to sense much in this strange place where they cannot see. But with rabbits, it was the otherwise. They spent half their lives underground in darkness or near darkness, and touch, smell, and hearing convey as much or more to them than sight. Hazel now had the clearest knowledge of where he was. He would have recognized the place if he had left at once and come back six months later. He was at the end of the largest burrow he's ever been in. Sandy, warm and dry, with a hard bare floor. There were several tree roots running down across the roof, and it seems to be supported in an unusual span. There was a great number of rabbits in the place, many more than he was bringing. All had the same rich smell as cowslip. Ooh. Cowslip himself was at the other end of the hall, and Hazel realized that he was waiting for the, him to reply. His own companions were still coming out of the entrance one by one, and there was a great deal of scrabbling and shuffling. He wondered if he ought to be very formal, whether or not he could be called a chief rabbit. He had no experience in this sort of thing. The Thirara, the Thira, would have no doubt have risen to the occasion perfectly. He didn't want to appear at a loss or let his followers down. He decided it would be best to be plain and friendly. After all, there was plenty of time as they settled down in the warren to show these strangers that they were as good as themselves without risking trouble to put on airs from the start. We're all glad you came out of the weather, he said. We're like all rabbits, happiest in a crowd. You have come over to see us in the field. Cowslip, you said that your barn wasn't large. By judging by the holes we saw along the bank, it must be 
reckon a fine big one. After he finished, he sensed a big wig had entered the hall, and he knew that all they were all together again. The stranger rabbit seemed slightly to skirm by his little speech and felt for some reason or other he had not struck the right note in complimenting them on their numbers. Perhaps there were not very many of them after all. Had there been a disease? There was no smell or sign of it. These were the biggest, healthiest rabbits he has ever seen. Perhaps their fidgeting and silence had nothing to do with what he had said. Perhaps it was simply that he was not smoking very well and being new at it. They felt he was not up to their fine ways. Never mind, he thought. After last night, I'm sure of my own lot. We wouldn't be here if they all weren't handy in a pinch. These other fellows will have to get to know us, and they don't seem to dislike us anyway. There was no more speeches. Rabbits have their own conventions and formalities that they are few and short by human standards. If Hazel had been a human, he would have been expected to introduce his companions one by one without no doubt would have been taken in charge as a guest of one of their hosts. In the Great Burrow, however, things happened differently. Rabbits mingled naturally. They do not talk for talking's sake. It's an artificial manner that human beings, and sometimes even their dogs and cats do. But this did not mean they were not communicating. Merely they, they were not communicating by talking. All over the burrow, both the newcomers and those who were at home were accustoming themselves to each other in their own way and their own time. Getting to know what the strangers smelled like, how they moved, how they breathed, how they scratched, to feel the rhythms and pulses. These were the topics and subjects of discussion carried on without the need of speech. To the greater extent that a human in a similar gang, each rabbit, as he pursued his own fragment, was sensitive to the trend of the whole. After a time, all knew that the concourse was not going to turn sour or break up in a fight. Just as battle begins in the state of equilibrium between the two sides, which generally alters one way or the other until it's clear that the balance has tilted so far that the issue is no longer in doubt. So this gathering of rabbits in the dark, beginning its hesitant approaches, silence, pauses, movements, crouching side by side, and all the matter attended of appraisals, slowly moved like a hemisphere of the world into summer to warmer, brighter regions of mutual liking and approval until all were felt sure that they had nothing to fear. Pipkin, some way from Hazel, crouched at ease between two large rabbits who could have broken his back in a second. While Buckthorn and Cowslip started a playful scuffle and nipping each other like kittens, then breaking off to comb the ears in a comical pretense of sudden gravity. Only Fiverr sat alone and apart. He seemed either ill or very much depressed, and the strangers avoided him instinctively. What a, what, what a, this guy's just nothing but an ass. I'm special. The knowledge that gathered around around safety, a safety around the corner came to Hazel in the form of reciliations of Silver's head and paws sticking out through the gravel. Recollection of Silver's head and paws breaking through the gravel. He at once felt a warm, relaxed, and he would have already cost the whole length of the hall just to press close to two rabbits, a buck and a doe. Each of them were fully as large as cowslip. Then both together took a few slow hops down one of the runs nearby. Hazel followed a little, and all three moved in and out of the, uh, out of the hall. They came to a small burrow 
deeper underground. Eventually, this belonged to the couple, where they settled down as though at home they made objections to Hazel did the same. There was a mood in the great hall that passed between them, and all three were silent for a time. Is Cowslip the cheap rabbit? asked Hazel at length. The other replied with a question. Are you called Chief Rabbit? Hazel found this awkward to answer. If he replied he was, his new friends might address him. So in the future, and you can imagine that Big Wig and Silver would have something to say to that. <laughs> As usual, he fell back on plain honesty. We're only a few, he said. We left our warren in a hurry to escape from bad things. Most stayed behind with the Chief Rabbit was one of them. I've been trying to lead my friends, but I don't know whether they care to call me Chief Rabbit. Well, that'll make them ask a few questions, Hazel thought. Why did you leave? Why didn't the rest come? What are you afraid of? Whatever I'm going to say. The other rabbit spoke, however, it was clear either he had no interest in what Hazel said or else he had some other reason not to question him. We don't call anybody the sheep rabbit, he said. It was cow slip out, I did, to go out and see you this afternoon. So he's the one who went. But who decides to do about Elil and digging and sending out starting parties and so on? Oh! <laughs> We never do anything like that. A little keep away from here. There's a humble last winter, but the man comes out in the fields and he shot it with his gun. He's startled. But men won't shoot a humba. Well, he killed this one. Anyway, he kills owls too, and we never need to dig. No one's digged in my lifetime. Oh, the burrow's lying empty, you know. Rats live in one part, but the man kills them all as well when he can. We don't need expeditions. There's better food here than anywhere else. Your friends will be happy here. But he himself did not particularly sound happy. And once again, Hazel felt oddly perplexed. Where does the man, he began, but he was interrupted. I am called Strawberry. This is my doe, Nidrohane. Nidrohane means song of the blackbird. Some of the best pearls are quite close. I say to you, in case your friends who might want to settle in them, the great pearl is a splendid place, don't you think? I'm sure there's not many warrants where all the rabbits can meet together underground. The roof is rabbit roots. Well, tree roots, you know, and the course of a tree outside that keeps the rain out from coming through as well. It's a wonder the tree's alive, but it is. He suspected Strawberry's talking had real purpose on preventing his own questions. He was partly irritated and partly mystified. Never mind, he thought. If we all get as big as these chaps, we shall do very, very well. There must be some good food around here somewhere. This doe was a beautiful creature too, though. Perhaps there's some more like her in the Warren. Strawberry moved out of the burrow and Hazel followed him to, into another run, leading deeper down below the wood. And it was certainly a Warren to admire. Sometimes it run across a run that led upward into a hole and then back down through another hole where you can hear the rain outside. It was falling in the night. But although it has been raining for some time, both the drainage and the ventilations were better than he has been accustomed to. Here and there, other rabbits were here on the move. Once they came upon Acorn, who evidently has been taken of a tour of some kind. Very friendly, I did, he said to Hazel as they passed one another. 
I've never dreamed we'd reach a place like this. You've got a wonderful judgment, Hazel. And Strawberry waited politely for him to finish speaking, and Hazel could not help being pleased that he must have been heard. After, you know, at last, after skirting around some of the openings, there was a distinct smell of rats. They halted into some kind of a pit. The steep tunnel led up to the air, and rabbits' runs lend to be, tend to be bow-shaped, but this one was straight. That was above them through the mouth of the hole. Hazel could see leaves against the night sky. He realized that one of the wall of the pit was convex and made of some sort of hard substance. He sniffed it uncertainly. Don't you know what those are? Says Strawberry. The bricks, stones that men make their houses out of. We used them to be here a long time ago, but it's all filled up now. Men don't use it anymore, so it's like an outer side of the well shaft. And this earth wall is completely flat because of some man thing fixed behind it in the ground. We're not sure why. There is something stuck in it, says Hazel. Why, their stones push to the surface. But what do they fall? Do you like it? Asked Strawberry. Hazel was puzzled over the stones. They were all the same size and pushed in regular intervals into the soil. He could not make out, he could not make nothing out of them. What are they for? He asked again. It's El Alara, said Strawberry. A rabbit called Lithorermian did it. Some time, a long time ago. You could have others, but this was best. Worth the visit, don't you think? Hazel was more at a loss than ever. He had never seen a labyrinthium and puzzled by the name, which in Latapane, the, uh, the rabbit language, means poison tree. How could a rabbit be named poison? Who the hell would name their rabbit? Son or daughter, poison. What do you think, Nicholas? Call some poison. Okay. So, and how the stones be El El Ra? Poison. Yeah, poison tree means poison. What exactly was it Strawberry was saying was El El Ra? In the confusion, he said, I don't understand. It's what we call a shape, explained Strawberry. Shape. Haven't you ever seen one before? Stones make a shape of El El Ra on the hole, stealing the king's lettuce. Power was running out. You know, Hazel had felt so much bewildered once Blackberry has talked about the rapified the Anim born. Obviously, the stones could not be anything to do with El El Ra. It seemed to him that Strawberry might as well have said his tail was an oak tree. He snipped again and put a paw on the wall. Steady, steady, said Strawberry. You might damage it, and that will never do. Never mind, we will come down to visit again some other time. But, but where are, as Hazel began, when Strawberry once more interrupted him. I expect you to be hungry now. I know I am. I'm going to go on all, you know, all raining all night. I'm certain of that. And we can feel uh, the underground here, you know. And uh, you can sleep in the Great Burrow or in my place if you prefer. We can get back to get back more quickly the same way we came. There's a run here that goes almost straight. Actually, it passes across. He chatted on relentlessly as they made their way back. It suddenly occurred to Hazel that these desperate interruptions seemed to follow any question with beginning where, he thought. He would put it to the proof. After a while, Strawberry ended up saying, we're nearly at the Great Burrow now, and we're coming in different way. And where, said he? Instantly, Strawberry turned into a short run, no, into a side run, and called, King Cup, are you coming down to the Great Burrow? There was silence. That's odd, said Strawberry returning once more to leading the way. He's generally there about this time. I often call out to him, you know. 
Hazel, hanging back, made a quick search with his nose and whiskers. The threshold of the burrow was covered with day-old fall of soft soil for the roof above. Strawberry's prints had marked it plainly, and there was no others whatsoever. That is the end of episode 13, called Hospitality of Water Ship Down. Something in really bad. <sighs> something, uh, something in England stinks real bad, too, right on the downs. Yep. Yeah, we're kind of wondering, what's going on here? So I try to make up as many voices as I can for these characters, so I'm trying to get there. Strawberry has always been a bit of a chatterbox, if anybody ever remembers seeing him in the, in the film, and, of course, anybody that's quite familiar with the book. So, anything else? Uh, the mystery thickens. Uh, uh, who? Uh, 